I'm very pleased this morning to introduce you to Phil Reasons. Phil is the Executive Director of Morningstar Fishermen. Uh, their, their work is aquaponic research and training. Uh, with their help, ECHO has installed a very small aquaponic uh, demonstration area over near our Appropriate Technologies Center. And uh, in looking at Morningstar's website and thinking about our tiny little demonstration, I was quite impressed that in their hatchery and training facility alone, they have tanks that hold over 110,000 gallons of water. So we're talking about a pretty remarkably sized aquaponics operation. Phil not only serves as executive director of Morningstar Fishermen, he has uh, 40 years of experience related to farming in the mid Midwest. And of course, we know that if you've had experience farming in God's country, that's experience you can build on. <clears throat> um, he also has had experience managing uh, and operating both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. He's uh, served uh, a number of times as a coordinator for disaster relief efforts here in the States and has worked around the world to help communities develop sustainable food production processes and systems. Please join me in welcoming Phil Reasons. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And, and uh, you know, I want to say thank you. I don't know if, if Stan and, and Beth are here, but uh, for all the work and the team, I'm sure, man, there's probably 100 people involved in putting this event on. And... Uh, Hey, let's, it's probably going to happen at some point, but let's just kick it off now. Let's give a hand to that team of people who made all this come together. <clears throat> so a pastor, a doctor, and a farmer walk into a room. <laughs> and you would think that's a joke, but really that's the 2015 Echo Conference so far. <laughs> How many of you have just been wowed by what you've listened to already? It's just incredible. Amen. I, I completely will agree. Um, it's, I love coming to events like this one at Echo, and maybe there aren't very many like this. You guys are kind of one of a kind. This is an incredible uh, presentation that you put together with all the workshops and the presenters, and uh, I'm honored to just be a part of that, and it's a privilege for me to be here. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, it's, the reality is this wouldn't be much fun for me if I were just standing here talking to an empty room. So really, you guys are what it's all about. It's not about us. And as much as we all love Echo, it's not really about Echo. It's about you and how important you are and the difference that you can make. Because uh, all the work and efforts that our organizations uh, put together to try to make a difference in the world, we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, we know that we need a mass army of people that are dedicated, committed, and out uh, changing the world. And I think before that can happen, you have to believe that it can happen. And we have this saying at Morningstar, um, when we do our training sessions, our students come in, and uh, one of the things that I ask them to do, I go through this little exercise and, and uh, show them how important they are. You know, I, I come from a lineage of farmers, and my grandfather used to say that the best thing for my garden is my shadow. And when I was a kid, I didn't really understand exactly what he was saying, but the reality is the best thing for your crops is you. You are what makes the difference. Whether they're watered, cared for, whether you're, you're neglecting them, it's really all about you. You matter. So one of the things we do at Morningstar to try to drive that reality home is every morning through our five-day training course, we greet everybody by saying, hello, Bob, nice to meet you. You matter. Now here's something I'd like to challenge you guys. This week when you're here, 
There's an impressive array of knowledge, experience that's here in this room. And I know that I personally will learn a lot from you. And you guys have already been encouraged to connect with one another, to learn from each other. And here's what I want you to do. When you greet someone in the morning, just shake their hand, get their name, and just re reaffirm them, or reassure them that they matter. Can you guys do that? Can you just say, hey, you matter? Because you do. This is really all about you. Look to the person next to you right now and tell them, you matter. <clears throat> Hey, doesn't that feel good? You know, we, uh, I, I love to hear it. Did you guys all love to hear that you matter? It, it sometimes, and I don't know why our culture is this way, but we have a hard time giving out verbal praises to people. It makes us uncomfortable. I don't know why, because we all love to hear them more than anything in the world. We love to hear how important we are, how good we are, what a good job we did, how good looking we are. We love to hear that, but it's difficult for most of us to say. So you're going to get a chance to practice this week one simple little phrase, and the phrase is, you matter. You got it? Let's say it together. The phrase is, you matter. All right, that's good. Now, you might think that a conference like this is all about knowledge, and uh, um, one of the, I mean, I hear this phrase often that says, knowledge is power. And I think that that's a little bit misdirected, because if it was really just about knowledge, we could have stayed home and Googled all this information, uh, but it's not just about knowledge. It's about the application of knowledge. How do we effectively apply knowledge so that it makes a difference and it can change the world? I believe that you matter, that you can take the knowledge and its correct application and change the world. One of my favorite authors and poets, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, says this, the world steps aside for a man who knows where he's going. And we'll include women, because I believe he meant the same. For men and women who know where they're going, the world steps aside. You know what that tells me? If I believe that I can do it, if I believe I have something to communicate, the seas will part, the world will step aside, and I can change the world. And I'm no different than you. I'm a farmer who grew up with dirty overalls and dirty jeans all the time, uh, running around usually with no shirt on through the summer, uh, putting up hay. I'm just a normal guy. But I believe that God will use me to change the world just like he will you, because you matter. All right, let's move on here. You can kick my little slide thing up there. That'll be good. Okay, and learn to write buttons. All right, let me tell you just a half a second about myself. Um, I did grow up in the Midwest, God's country, except July and August, and then I think the devil takes over for a little while there. <laughs> but otherwise, it's, it's pretty good. Good fertile soil. I... I moved to Florida thinking, I've moved to a tropical area. Man, this is going to be great. I can grow anything. Wow, was I forever mistaken. <laughs> I could plant a seed pretty much anywhere on our farm and crops would grow. Florida? No, you better spend about five years building soil before your crops are going to grow. So my background is in row crops, traditional as it's called now, traditional agriculture, and, and really primarily uh, black Angus cattle. I was a cattleman. You know, my father had me in cowboy boots and spurs when I was four years old. And that's just the way it was for me. And I loved it. And honestly, still have this infatuation with cattle in the cattle industry. But I've learned some things that now uh, cause me to think a little bit different. I also grew up with this really strange addiction to tropical fish and primarily cichlids. I just really couldn't get enough of breeding and studying the ecosystems of African cichlids. My poor mother, I mean, my, my bedroom was filled with aquariums, and many times she got down on her hands and knees and helped sop up the, the water from my 
you know, self-made breeder tanks that blew apart in the middle of the night and water went everywhere. I don't know why she put up with it. Maybe she saw something divine in this whole process that for me was just, I was crazy uh, about fish. Now, I can see now the orchestration that God had in mind and the wonderful blessing that this experience could become to others. So let me tell you a little bit about the organization that I'm now partnered with, Morningstar Fishermen. Uh, we're just a few miles up the road here in Central Florida. So for you northerners that are driving back up, hey, swing by and, and see our facility. We were started in 1993 by Hans and Sigrid Geisler. They came over from Germany, you know, to pursue the American dream. And I think they both would agree that God got a hold of them and it was a much bigger vision than the American dream, but to embrace God's dream for them. So we, uh, we're primarily a research and training facility. We focus on aquaponics, and I know there's a lot of dirt farmers here. How many, how many farmers or gardeners here in the room? How many? Oh, wow, wow. Hey, we're surrounded by greatness here. This is fantastic. Hey, let me say this to the farmers and gardeners. Thank you for every day getting on your hands and knees and thinning carrots or, or pulling radishes or weeding your beans or, you know, thank you for the, God only knows how many hours you pick those little caterpillars off your collards or your cabbage or your tomatoes. Thank you for not quitting when you had a, a late frost and it took out all your new crop or you had an early frost and there went your harvest. Thank you for doing what you do because all of us, all of us depend on the labors, the commitments of our farmers. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, here's a photograph of our, our uh, I'm going to have a lot of pictures because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a pastor. So all that really smart stuff is kind of, you know, out the window for me. I'm just going to talk to you like a farmer. You all okay with that? All right, so um, this is our greenhouse at, at Morningstar, and um, again, we're a demonstration facility. So you notice banana plants growing in our aquaponic system. I'm not telling you the best way to grow bananas is aquaponically. I'm demonstrating lots of different ways in which it can be done. So here's some of our lettuce varieties. We're growing our little topsy turdies as well. We're always experimenting with lots of different things. These are some of our very healthy and very happy hybrid tilapia. Uh, we have a few there. So, and also, if you're interested in starting an aquaponic project, we can ship them to you uh, pretty much anywhere you are in the country. Here's our classroom. So we, um, we teach um, integrated aquaponics. So with my background in soil farming, um, and my passion for fish and what they can do, I, uh, I incorporate those together. So there are some crops that we believe uh, thrive in an aquaponic environment. There are some that do not. I'm not up here to wave the banner to try to get everybody to convert over to growing aquaponically. I'm here to tell you that there are real world benefits to growing aquaponically and there's a bigger benefit to integrating the aquaponic model with a traditional, sustainable, organic, in-soil or terrestrial garden. You have to have a constant supply of water to water your plants in the ground. You have to have a constant supply of nutrients or very, very rich soil. Aquaponics affords that because the wastewater from the system not only produces our plants aquaponically, but it produces the plants that we're fertilizing, or we say fertigating from the soil. Here's a couple of photographs of projects that we've developed either around Florida or uh, the, the top left project. That's, uh, that's a project in central Florida. Um, the lower one is also left. I'm sorry, you're right. You're, you're left, get this right. Uh, the, the one on the right is a, a commercial project. Uh, the two on your left, those are at a church. Both of those are at churches. Uh, churches have uh, 
built these, or we actually built them for them. A big demonstration greenhouses where they're growing food that they make available to their uh, needy uh, congregation. And then also a demonstration to encourage them to get busy about growing their own food. Uh, the top right project is a project that we built in Arizona. Here's what causes us to do what we do. We believe that God's provision is here on the earth. That men, women, and children suffer needlessly because they don't understand how to benefit from what God has already provided. So, simply put, here's what I endeavor to do every day. I want to introduce people to God's provision. And then my heart's desire is that those same people, once they've experienced God's provision, will have a desire to know the provider because that gets me up and gets me going every day. What is aquaponics? Aquaponics is the integration of animal and plant culture in an aquatic media. Now, I'm not going to spend much time talking about all the nuts and bolts of aquaponics here in this presentation, but if you're interested in all of that boring stuff that makes it all happen, I'm doing a workshop on Friday, so come to the workshop, unless it's sold out, which I don't know. Uh, we teach, which I've already mentioned, integrated aquaponic farming. Fish waste becomes the nutrients for plants. Water transports the nutrients to the plants. Now, one of the things, and I will just say this, one of the misnomers about aquaponics is that plants grow from the fish poop. I'm sorry if that offends people, but, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer, so that's what we do. The fish uh, effluent. So, <clears throat> Does that sound better? <laughs> All right. So, uh, but the reality is your fish will produce more effluent than, than actually is needed. It's the nitrification process, which is primarily driven by ammonia, which comes from the urine from the fish, that converts to the nitrogen that the plants then absorb. So if you manage an aquaponic system properly, in our opinion, you have more fished waste than your system needs, and that has to be removed. Perfect opportunity for you to integrate now and fertilize your crops growing in the ground. Benefits of aquaponics. This more crop per drop. Now, for us, this is huge. Because I mean, here in the States, most of us can just walk over to the faucet, 10 of which are around our house or, or in our house, and turn it on and we have fresh, clean water. But that's not the case where we do most of our work. Most of our work, if you're going to put a drop of water on your plants, somebody has walked five or six kilometers carrying buckets or bowls, got down and scooped that stuff up and maybe had somebody help them put it on their head, and they've walked back with that water. That's precious cargo now. So we want to do the very best we can to grow as much as possible with every drop of water. It's vital to us. Water's kind of a big deal. I don't know if you guys knew that. Water's kind of important. You know, we can go a long time without fossil fuels. There's a lot of news coverage about fuels, and there's a lot of stuff about energy and all of that, and, you know, it's important. But I'm telling you what's really important is water, because any one of us, seven days without it, and we're toes up. We're done. It's over. So water is a big deal. Now, when I'm speaking... Uh, like, really, today, there's a bunch of fifth graders that are upset because I usually go and speak at the Great American Teach-In in our community, and uh, I speak to fifth graders. One of the things I tell them when I'm talking about the importance of water is that we're not consuming water. We're not going to run out of water. The, the same water that the dinosaur drank thousands of years ago or millions of years ago, depending on your eschatology, um, when that dinosaur drank that water and peed that water out, it's still here. That didn't go anywhere. It's still on the planet. It just keeps converting and converting and converting. The earth, as God designed it, is an amazing water filter. It filters the water that gets converted. 
convert it from clean water to nutrient-rich water. <laughs> the earth can filter that out, absorb those nutrients, grow the food that we need to eat. But here's what's happening today. We are abusing the planet. We're polluting water faster than the earth has capacity to filter it. Or we're polluting it with chemicals that the earth wasn't designed to filter. So we're not in danger of losing water. We're in danger of losing clean water or access to clean water. And a lot of the world right now, a lot of the places that we work, in, especially in West Africa, their, um, their access to clean water is fairly limited. They, and it's difficult. They've got to walk to get to it. Water is a big deal. Uh, the benefits of aquaponics, it's drought tolerant. Now, a lot of people would say initially, how, how can this be? Aquaponics is about raising fish. You have to use so much water to make this happen. How can you say it's drought tolerant? Well, here's, here's what we do. Every place that we go to put in an aquaponic farm, uh, we also uh, install a deep well. So, and then most of the time, we have to come up with a way to get that water up out of that borehole because there's no electricity in those areas. And I'll talk about that more and show you some pictures in, in a little bit. But if there's no rain, subsistence farmers are really in trouble. And so what we try to do is stabilize those regions, whether there's rain or not. So if a farmer says, okay, I've got to get my crop planted because I think the rains are coming, and I've got to get them in before the rains come, and he puts it all in, and then the rains don't come, he may lose his whole crop. Now, for us at Morningstar, we do lots of research. So if I plant a crop and it doesn't come up, okay, an intern will go out and tear that out, and then an intern will go out and plant another one, and thank God we love interns, and then we'll research some more. But I'm still going to eat tonight. My family is still going to eat. If, if I'm in an area where subsistence farmers are living based on their crop production, and their crops don't produce, uh, it's a lot more serious. That's why we take our research very seriously. I want to fail. I want to fail. I want to fail. I want to fail. Because if I fail, and then eventually find something that works, hopefully, I'm stopping them from having to experience that same failure. And we can go and convey, this, this works. If you'll do it this way, this works and we can help them to eliminate the crop failures that some of them have. So it's a big deal. The droughts, now you've got a system that's growing in water. We've, we've uh, almost eliminated evaporation from our system. Uh, research has been done by universities that say that it's about, it uses about 5% of the water to produce a crop aquaponically that it would take to grow that same crop crop in the soil. And the main reason for that is because when you take water, if I take a gallon of water and I pour it on my tomato plant, that plant goes, ah, and some of it gets absorbed into the plant. The plant goes out and takes in. But you know what? It only takes in what it needs, unlike us when we're at the buffet at Denny's. It only takes in what it needs. And so the water that doesn't get converted, some of it evaporates. Some of it wicks away, the soil pulls it away from the plant, and now when the plant needs more, it's no longer available. So you have to pour more on the crop to get it to grow. Farmers understand this. We do this all the time. In an aquaponic system, those roots are just swinging around, loving life, because they have all of the water that they need whenever they need it. The roots are not going to take in more water than they need, and every time they want it, it's right there, ready for them. What they don't use, circles right around, and it's available the next time. It's a very water-conserving method of agriculture or farming. It has a very small footprint. We're, we're very excited about uh, one of our new models of farms that we've developed. It sits on less than two acres. It has the potential to produce four tons of fish protein and about four to six tons of produce. Now we have these farms 
in, in work. I mean, it, they're, they're farming and they're working today. While we're here, maybe they're done by, by now, but uh, they're, they're working right now farming these micro farms and they're working fantastic. It's local production. How many of you know that in America, 1,500 miles is the average that your food travels before it gets to your plate? That's the average. Hey, that's ridiculous. And we can all say, yeah, that's probably not sustainable. But what happened? You know, Grandpa used to grow the food, Grandma used to can the food, and the family used to all eat it. That seems to become a thing of the past. Now, we don't even know who grows it. We don't even know who prepares it. We just want the cheapest stuff that we can buy at the grocery store because none of us have the money that we seem to used to have. So we, we've developed a culture here in America, to me, is scary. And I don't see a good future in it. And it's time for change. It's also, aquaponics also is a great reduction of wastewater. Now, when you compare aquaponics to aquaculture, aquaponics is the, the symbiotic relationship between aquaculture, that's raising fish or animals in water, and hydroponics, that's growing plants without soil. You put those together, we're utilizing that waste, that affluent water. In, in standard aquaculture, which Florida's big in aquaculture, water has to be flushed out 10 to 15% per week, sometimes higher depending on your biomass ratios. So massive amounts of poo are getting flushed right into the streams and the rivers. And in Florida, we have this tourism where we love these crystal clear springs, these glass bottom boats. Nobody's happy when the river turns green and you can't see out of the boat anymore. And a lot of that is happening because of massive wastewater coming from, from uh, aquaculture facilities. Okay, the global need for sustainable aquaponics. Water, nutrition, economic, and social. Let's talk about water for a little bit. Um, you know, if you've traveled into developing nations, you've seen this many, many times. And it seems like every road you're on, there are just trails of people walking, and many of them carrying water or carrying bundles of sticks. Because water is a big deal, and it's the sustenance of life. We have to have it. Now, the sticks, they, most people, they still cook on an open fire. Um, and I know for us, you think oh, that's some kind of caveman thing, because you know, for as long as you've known, you've cooked on an electric or a gas stove in your house. But there, three quarters of the world still cooks like this. Three quarters of the world. I took a young college student uh, to a country in West Africa, and we're in a small village, no electricity, no running water, and a big market. And he's watching this, and I could see his eyes were huge. And I said, this is crazy, isn't it? And he goes, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I said, I know. It's crazy that three quarters of the world is like this, and, and we think this is crazy. We're the minority. Most of what goes on is this right here. It's people carrying water. It's people having to go out and gather sticks in order to boil the water that they just carried so they don't end up with that hideous guinea worm that Dr. Christie was talking about. That's horrible. I'll have nightmares thinking about that thing crawling out the bottom of my foot. I'm wearing my shoes when I'm in Africa from now on. So water is a big deal. You guys getting that theme? Water is a big deal. Nutrition is so important. So many of the diseases, I've sat down and interviewed doctors in, in foreign countries, and I said, what do you see mostly? And a lot of them will say first, moto accidents. Well, you visit some of these countries, you'll understand why moto accidents are, are number one. But then almost every other treatment, the top, their nutritional issues or their um, lung respiratory issues coming from breathing the smoke, from cooking, uh, inside their huts all the time. These are serious concerns globally uh, that we need to address. Nutrition is important. Um, I stuck this photo in here. Does anybody know what that's a picture of on that big bag right there? What is it? Yeah, it's the Statue of Liberty. I saw this in West Africa. Now, West Africa traditionally has been a rice-producing region, 
their climate is right in certain areas, and they've produced a lot of rice. So I kept seeing these, these bags, and I asked my driver, I said, uh, what is that? I see this Statue of Liberty everywhere. And he goes, oh, that's rice from America. And I said, why is there rice from America here? I mean, you guys are a rice-producing region. And he goes, oh, no, 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 we don't really produce much rice. So I thought, okay, well, maybe there's some reason, you know, disease or some kind of blight or some kind of nematode affecting the rice. And he said, well, the farmers stopped producing rice when this rice came because it was half price for what our farmers used to sell. So, hey, I'm an optimist. So I said, well, at least the people are getting rice for half price. And he said, no, no, no. That only lasted for a few years. And he goes, now this rice is four times the price of what we used to pay for rice. But our farmers left the, the agricultural areas, went to the cities, and now they're not farming. We have to stop doing these kinds of things. Now, I'm not going to wax political, but can anyone make out what's written across the bottom of this bag? Can you see that? I'll leave it at that. Let's go to the next slide. All right, global needs for sustainable aquaponics obviously is nutrition. There's such a huge, huge uh, gap in, in what's being consumed in a lot of these villages. Uh, I'm encouraged that there's not as much starvation as there used to be. And I'm encouraged that the caloric intake globally is going up. That's a very encouraging fact and truth for me to, uh, to accept. But what concerns me is that I see it's carbohydrates, 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 carbohydrates. So it's cassava, yucca, manioc, it's yams, it's rice. It's just, it's just a lot of that. And I'm thankful that they have that because, trust me, if it's me, I would rather have that as caloric intake as nothing. So I'm thankful that it's there. And, hey, we all know we need carbohydrates. The problem that we see is that there doesn't seem to be a balance. The, the FAO says there's 925 million people today that are malnourished around the world. 925 million. Now that's a difficult number for us to wrap our minds around. You know, most of us don't deal with those size numbers every day. I know my bank account doesn't have those kind of numbers in it. So that's a big number. So here's what I do. This helps me a lot. I realize that the population of all of the Americas, North America, Central America, South America, is about 914 million people. So the correlation between how many people are starving, how many people uh, are malnourished, uh, this is what I do. When I'm at a conference or when I'm at a school or when I'm in our classroom, uh, every person that I see, you represent to me somebody that's malnourished. Everyone here, we're all now fed well. If you had time, you made it past the table. Thank God for goodies. But you guys represent somebody in the world who is not going to get the nutrients that they need today to sustain healthy growth. And see, when I look at you and I see your smiles and I see, you know, ladies, you did such a good job putting your makeup on and getting your hair all looking so nice. Guys, hey, you know, what can I say? You are what you are. God loves you. Uh, you represent somebody that's in need today. And I believe that you matter. I believe that you have the ability to make a difference, even if it's for one. That's huge. Imagine if that one were you or the person sitting next to you that you love. You matter. You can make a difference. Nutrition is important. Economics are also important. Uh, it's... It's difficult to think about the consumption of protein. You know, we, we sell, uh, like in, in Togo, we sell our fish for 1,500 CFR per kilo. 1,500 CFR per kilo. So that's about $3 per kilo. So roughly $1.50 a fish when we're selling it for, uh, we're selling them around a pound. So now the average farmer in Togo, West Africa, makes about $1.50 a day. 
So if you think about, now let's, so $1.50 a day, $1.50 for a fish. Let's convert that to Americanized standards. The average American makes somewhere between $130 and $150 a day, average. Could you imagine paying $150 for one fish? I think you're probably going to eat rice. You're probably going to eat manioc and cassava because you're not going to be able to take a day's wage and buy one fish. See, that's the challenge. Now, here's the beauty. If I can teach an African farmer to produce one fish a day to sell at the market, he has a full-time job. In America, he's got to produce 100 fish a day to get a full-time job. So the economics there work great from a standpoint of we can introduce this protein, give them jobs, allow them to do what they need to do. Time flies. Social. It's uh, huge. Here's what I want to talk about. The keys to collaboration. I don't know. That was all an intro. We just got to this. <clears throat> the key is collaboration. Have you guys heard a lot about collaboration so far? I think it's, it's pretty important. Five partners that we found that, that are important to making this happen. Community, boots on the ground, education, construction, and funding. I want to talk about each one of them briefly. Community. This is a partner that most people overlook. In the U.S., this is the hardest partner for us to find. An agrarian community. People that will embrace the ideology of growing food for self-consumption. We have a very poor community just north of us. We have volunteered to help them implement a sustainable food producing system. I cannot get buy-in from anybody in the community. They won't do it. Missionaries, if you're thinking about doing something like this in a community where you're working, let me say this. Save yourself some pain and effort. If they are not an agrarian community, if they're not going to eat the fish and grow the food, save yourself the trouble. Don't do it. Boots on the ground. We made a mistake one time of going into Nicaragua thinking that we could do it all. I call that project now the Nicaraguan nightmare. You have to have a boots on the ground organization. Somebody that understands the culture, speaks the language, knows the people, can work you in and out, get the right people to do the jobs. It's critical. You can't do it without them. You have to have education and training. That's why we are so important. It really is true. I've seen aquaponic systems in different countries around the world. I saw one not too long ago that they were washing their laundry in it and they were watering their goats from it. Now, I don't fault the people because they know how to do laundry. They know how to take care of goats. Nobody trained them and taught them how to do aquaponics effectively. So it failed. What do they do? They do their laundry and they water their goats. Consultation, support, and training is key. Hey, we can all wax as earthen and tree-hugging and spiritual as we want to be, but the reality is all of these projects cost money. When, when I get on the plane at the end of the week and take off across the ocean, somebody's paying for that. It costs money to do what needs to be done. They're a critical partner. Design for desired outcomes. Be realistic. Understand your limitations. Know the needs of your market, return on investment, count the cost. A few pictures of projects. Here's one in Haiti. I just talked with the guys from Haiti. This is at Love a Child. It's our first class from Love a Child. Uh, Bobby with his big, fat blue tilapia. This is Iris Ministries, a collaboration. This is in Malawi, in Africa. Children eating from the system. Wonderful, wonderful. This is a project in uh, Palime, Togo. I'm out of time, but I want to tell you one story. Hey, these slides are going to be made available to somebody, I'm sure, right? Okay. This is a, this is a collaboration, uh, Morningstar, Fisherman, CWE, and ABWE. This is in, in Palime, Togo. These are blind children at a school. And I'm going to close with this story. I got a phone call in May of this year from the director at this center. And um, she proceeds to tell me the story, how that she was um, engaging with one of her managers. Their organization is very strict on documenting everything. Um, and she said one of the things they have to do is keep a medical log. So they have to log 
Every time a medication is dispensed, every time a child goes to a clinic or goes to the hospital or any ailments or, or uh, illnesses. So uh, first quarter was up, she was meeting with her manager and when they opened the medical log, it was empty. And so she proceeded to scold him abruptly for not keeping up with this. And uh, he said, uh, no, 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 Dobby Joan, that's what they call the director, uh, there were none. And she said, what do you mean none? We've gone all the way through the first quarter. And he said, there were none. We have not dispensed any medications. We have not had any children that needed to go to the clinic. We have not had to take any children to the hospital. So they began discussing amongst themselves, how can this be that this could be reality? So she called me with this realization. The only thing that's changed in our school is their food. They no longer eat food from the market that in Africa, they drench their crops with pesticides and herbicides. That doesn't get washed. It's horrible. So two years of eating healthy, protein, produce balanced diet, no medical, no prescriptions, healthy kids. Healthy kids change communities. Remember, you matter. Thank you very much.